Queens Connexus podcast. Queens Connexus is a fellowship of ministry leaders collaborating together here in Queens for the sake of seeing the kingdom of God advanced and church planting. Today, I have with us Lester, as always, and then David. How's it going, gentlemen? Well, how you doing? Good. Yeah. David, tell us a little bit about yourself. You pastor a church, yes? I do, yes. Uh, pastor a church um, in Ridgewood. It's actually on the border of Ridgewood and Bushwick, uh, so right in between uh, Brooklyn and Queens, uh, called Joyway Church. Um, and we planted it in uh, end of 2020, beginning of 2021. Okay, so still in church planter phase. Very of the much church, so. <laughs> yes. The life of your church. Yes. Okay. Did you grow up here in Queens, New York? Uh, I actually grew up in in that neighborhood. So my my the the church that we planted meets about seven or eight blocks from the the house that I grew up in most wow. of my life. So who's we? Uh, uh, so my my brother, uh, his name is Io. Um, he he and I started a, a church uh, with a, a group of friends of ours. Uh, we after, during the pandemic were in need of just uh, a Christian community. They were uh, many of them were had a lot of questions or were falling away from the faith altogether. So our solution was was really just share with them Jesus mm -hmm. and walk through a book. We walked through the book uh, Habits of Grace with uh, by David Mathis and just going through the spiritual disciplines. And from that birth, the church, the group went from three to about 30 in different locations. And we're like, okay, God's clearly doing something here. Uh, so we just went with it. And now Joyway Church exists. It's named after actually the block that uh, my my childhood home is on. Uh, its commemorative name is Joy Way, oh, and way. the reason that it's named that, that. That's yeah, so cool. yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, the reason it's named that is because a lot of the ministry that we did was on that block. Oh. So we decided then. Oh, now we know. There you go. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. So when you. I mean, you didn't seek out to plant Joyway based Not on that even story? a little bit. No, 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 no. Wow. It was, again, during the pandemic. So if we were going to try and plant a church strategically, you wouldn't pick a global pandemic. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you, would, you would probably <laughs> think, you know. to come by, right? You know, all right. Um, uh, no, so it was, it was in response to a need, but even our, our solution was not originally a church. It was, let's just share Jesus with our friends. And then that just grew. And there were people who wanted to take communion and wanted to hear sermons and wanted to grow together. And we're like, okay, so it looks like God is planting a church then. But it was not our intention at all to start a church. There was no uh, planning meeting. We didn't have a year zero gathering, a fund rate, nothing. Wow. We just started. And yeah. Yeah. God's been faithful. Well, incredible. So... We are gathered to talk about indigenous church planting, and so we're going to continue to unpack your story a little bit more about indigenous church planting. And so can we define that as we get started? Because uh, Lester, you two have planted a church here in the community-ish where you grew up in here in Queens, and so both of you are indigenous church planters. And so let's define that, what we mean by that. Yeah, so... so what I say when, when I say indigenous church planting is, is very simply people who were born, raised in an area, and are starting a church there. Uh, oftentimes, especially in New York City, there are transplants or people from other states, countries, whatever, who come here to start a church. Uh, I think with the idea of like that Pauline uh, apostolic, yeah. uh, let's start a church here and, and gather a bunch of people. Um, but that's not what we've done at all. Um, we are from the neighborhood been here all my life and now yeah. church started. Yeah. And you too, Lester, you grew up here in Elmhurst. Yep. Yep. And you've planted here in Elmhurst, the Elm Church. Yeah. But David, um, a different David, but I, this is confusing. So I don't even like this word indigenous church. I know. I we were trying to think yeah, of it. No, we yeah. were even Called before we started recording, we were trying to <laughs> yeah, come up with a better, like, but it is, is a common else, language. Like a local church planter? Well, the locust, <laughs> local church planter could be a transplant. Yeah. Church planter too. So we're trying to distinguish between the person who moves into the community to plant yeah. a church or, versus someone who's already living here and I, seeks man, to plant their I just own. feel like I want to take back that word local, you know, like yeah. local, like you're born and raised here. Don't be a fake local. Yeah, but I'm local. <laughs> but I'm, you're I'm local to my community that's now. True, like yeah. I'm living and doing ministry that is, locally. That's true. As a transplant. How about this? Pastor. If you're listening to this and you find a better name for yeah. it, please, <laughs> please in the comment let section, us let us know no. and we'll adopt it. We will. So whatever we call it, <laughs> yeah. what we're talking about is church planting with leaders and people who did not move into the community in order to plant the church, but are native and have grown up in that community now seeking to take the gospel to their own community. That, that's, that's the idea. Essentially in contrast to a... a 
transplant. And we're not necessarily saying one's right or wrong. We'll talk about the differences between them, but we want to talk specifically for those here in New York because there is a great gospel need here in Queens. And that's one of the reasons why we collaborate together. And so we're grateful for people who are willing to move into the city to church plant. But we also are trying to raise up leaders as we plant churches here and raise up leaders of a local to turn around and serve their own community. And so we want to kind of give a description roadmap for people who may be on that path, talk about the positives to that, talk about some of the challenges that come along with that to kind of help guide uh, leaders along the way in that journey. So let's so let's start there. What are what have been some of the joys of planting Joyway Church on Joy Wade Road? <laughs> yeah, uh, trying to, I can't think of any other joys. But there you go. What what have been some of the, what have been some of just the the joys of that? Yeah, I think one of the main ones, and it, it's it's the driving motivator, is that I get to share the gospel with people that I've grown up with. So they're not strangers. Yeah. They're not. Uh, people who don't, who I don't know their story, they don't know my story. I get to watch my friends grow in Jesus, and that is probably the greatest joy mm. with with just the church that we've started. It started with us just being friends, um, and that's been watching them grow in Christian maturity and and, and all of that. It has been has been really really beautiful. Um, also watching how that community has reached out to others and have brought others into the fold again all friends, all family. For the most part, I think we've got maybe a few people who are a part of the church who just kind of found us on social media or whatever. But for the most part, it's us seeing families get saved, yeah. us seeing friends get saved. Um, and it is, that is, I think, the biggest joy for for me. It's that um, the the connection that I have to them is, it's a, a shared history. Right? Like I remember a few of the, the people who go to my church, I remember them from they were like eight or nine. Uh, I'm thinking of a friend of mine. His name is Justin. I've known him since I was seven years old. So like watching him grow in Jesus is a huge That's joy cool. and watching him teach his kids about who Jesus is and what Christ has done for them and watching them come to faith has been like, yeah, it's, it, it, I, I wouldn't trade that for, That's for the cool. world. Um, other joys is just like I, I mean I know my neighborhood so that's that's also that's also good I don't uh, there's there's some some study and I'll, I'll probably get to that when I talk about the the negatives but there's some study that I don't have to do because I like I know them I know this I know this yep. block I walked on this block for twenty something years uh, so that uh, watching a community grow amongst where I have all these memories is is really is really special. What about you, Lester? What are what have been some of the joys and uh, <clears throat> exciting things about planting in the place you grew up. Yeah. I I love what you just said because like you you know people, you know your neighbors, you know the business owners. Um, I, I would just add that I believe that the church should not just be insular, but also for the community, right? Like we do that for the neighborhood and that's why you know the block, you know the people. Mm-hmm. Um, for me to make a change with the church that we planted for the neighborhood, you got to know what's what's going on. You know, it's like for us, we know there's brothels. We know that there are like missing trash cans. We know that the sewage system is not up to date. You know, like we know that stuff because we grew up here. Like we had to walk across Queens Boulevard when it was flooded because the sewage system is just not, it's not updated. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so we are able to work with even things like city council members and assembly members and be like, hey, like you need to fight for this. Um, we know where there are undocumented residents and where to help because we grew up here. Uh, so that's, I would say the joy knowing that we know these ins and outs, like we know where the abandoned buildings are and we know where the day laborers are living in that abandoned building, you know, like, like we know where they are. I remember going to those abandoned yeah, buildings. Yeah, exactly. You know, like you just know where they are. So then you go, yeah. oh, I'm a Christian. Yes. Let's get the church together and do yeah. something for them, you know? Yeah. yeah. So stuff like that's really exciting. Okay. What about the difficulties? What have been some struggles, obstacles faced in the journey? Um, I think those those obstacles came from two two places. One of which is my own arrogance, in that the the neighborhood, my neighborhood, has changed so much over the past like 15, 20 years that there were moments where I assumed I knew exactly what it was, and I was actually wrong because the community had changed. Now, that change happens uh, specifically uh, Bushwick Ridgewood primarily due to gentrification. Mm-hmm. Um, so that uh, there's a lot of mourning and loss that comes with that. Uh, but 
in trying to be effective in ministry, I still had to recognize, yeah, this isn't the same place where, where I grew up necessarily. So the uh, negative part was because I'm from here, I thought I knew and I thought I didn't have to, to study and learn uh, what's actually going on here. Um, so I think I was bent towards that, which I think is everyone's bend in general, but I think yeah. I was bent towards that because I'm from here. Um, then the other negative, I think, came from the outside. Um, the idea that because I'm from the neighborhood, there are resources that I haven't looked into or there are strategies that I'm not tapping into that I should be or that I need to be um, from either church planting organizations or uh, other larger churches mm -hmm. who were looking at Joyway to see if they'd want to partner with us. Um, the idea that, oh, I know that you're from there, but you should be employing these tactics because that's what healthy churches do to grow. When I know, being from here, that those tactics and strategies won't actually work here. Right. So it was very, um, it was discouraging because it either made me uh, question whether or not I'm supposed to be doing this in the way that I feel like I'm called to mm -hmm. be doing this, or it meant that I felt the need to get defensive and say, well, no, actually this is mine. And like, that's just unpleasant. Um, so yeah, I think that there's a, a level of support also that's offered to uh, church planters who are coming yep. from somewhere else that <clears throat> I do not have access to. Um, there's also not uh, a valiant hero story either that I know a lot of yep. church planters are running off of. They drink that joint for fuel, right? Like I'm coming here. Can to you unpack that a little bit more? Be yeah. honest because oh, people 100%. need to hear this. What yeah, do you mean by yeah, that? Yeah. yeah. So I, I think that, um, as I, as I've spoken to some church planters and I, I, I want to stress some because there are some incredible church planters who are transplants and they have done the work and I'll describe that work um, in a bit, but they've come thinking that New York City is a cesspool of crime and villainy mm -hmm. and that it is a liberal hub where just anything goes and it's godless and terrible. Uh, and there have not been churches who have been here for literally hundreds of years <laughs> serving and loving communities and yeah. growing <laughs> leaders and people. And therefore, it is their job to come into Sodom and Gomorrah and save all of us. Um, and I think what comes with that first is this. Uh, the savior complex, this entitlement to yep. resources and to places and to people and to things. Uh, but then also this idea that they have the answer for people that they do not know. Yep. And I would argue do not love yep. because you can't yet. There's no way that you can love someone because you don't know them. You yep. don't talk to them. There's no way. And I think what happens there um, attached to that narrative, though, um, we were talking about it a bit before this, this colonial narrative is, is actually very similar to what you see with like a Christopher Columbus where it's, Hey, I need to go to the Americas to go like dominate the people. Yeah. Can you load me up with money and with people and with, uh, resources and with strategies? Yeah. Here's all this resources, go colonize. And then they get all that stuff because of this narrative of savior yeah. that for me, because I'm from here. I don't get to have that narrative behind me that I'm coming to go change the world. Yeah. I just get, oh, you're from the neighborhood. Cool, man. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> to process hot? effort. No. <laughs> no, no and, 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 and I want, yeah. to, and I want to, as <clears throat> a transplant yeah, yeah. pastor who's been there for six years or been here for six years, say um, that everything you just said is needs to be said. And I want to speak to it for a second as someone who came in and just l honestly, you probably described me a little too much. Mm. And and I'm and I'm recognizing. Wow, well, I mean, you, I mean, I'm unpacking what you're saying. And so, what you said was true. What you said needed to be said. And as someone who, here's what I want to say as I'm processing all that. If you just listened to what he had to say and you felt as a transplant minister of any kind, felt like that was an unhealthy caricature or you're offended, you probably need to go back and listen to it again. And I was someone who, because of faithful emphasis on the church I grew up at, on the importance of going and preaching the gospel to all people, came with that mentality of going, I am coming and bringing the gospel to New York. And that that phrase right there, the mm -hmm. gospel's been here yeah. That's right, yeah. faithfully for years. And this idea of coming and hear statements like I was reading just this past week of someone who's moving up from Arkansas to plant a church here. And they're 
everything they're saying was talking about the diversity of the place and all these different things and the st strategy of why it's good to plant a church here. And, and the truth is they're going to raise money using that yeah, language. 100%. And I remember coming here and I preached a sermon and uh, uh, someone came up to me afterwards and said, Hey, I, all I heard was you are here because it's strategic that it's very colonialistic and you don't love me. And for you to say that you don't really love New York yet probably offends someone who's like, no, I'm uprooting my life to move here. What are you talking about? <clears throat> and I just want to say, he's right. You don't love New York because mm -hmm. you don't know New York. You mm -hmm. don't know the people. And it was that moment for me when that person lovingly said that to me that I realized like, oh, like I've, I, I've got to stop thinking about strategy of why I'm here. And I've got to just love people. Anyways, and so I'm confessing and affirming and going, thank you for saying it. Yeah. And just want to take an opportunity as someone who's guilty of what you're saying to put an exclamation mark on what you said for everybody else who needs to hear it. I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, I think the those who have come as transplants and who have done the most, I think, excellent ministry. I mean, I'd shout out like a Larry Mayberry, yeah. who um, is a mentor friend. Um the way that he came was, I want to be a part of what God is doing. Yeah. Uh, and I want to participate in his work that's already happening yeah. there. And he lived here for over 10 years, right, to be a part of the community and then minister. Yeah. So that to me shows not like you're trying to come and colonize and that he's the answer, but that he is participating with God in that's God's good. work. Um, and that to me gives dignity and honor to not just the ministers who have come. And I'm, oh man, I remember this, 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 um, it was a part of my old church, but, uh, there's a, a conversation that was had with some of the people in the neighborhood and, uh, they were saying, Hey, like if, if you came to church, like, what would you want? And there's this woman who came out she said, Oh my goodness, I've been praying for this church for 30 years, mm -hmm. praying for a church to like finally enter into this, wow. this community and start reaching people. I'm so glad you guys are here. And that's just to say that Larry, for example, came here to participate in the prayers of yeah, people that's like good. that. That's so right? good. Like to like to to be to be an answered prayer, yeah. not to uh not to dominate and domineer. Because the, the reality is this if you're coming here because you think that you're bringing the gospel, your idol is impact, not love for people. Like you don't love people. You just want to 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 make really big waves in a place that you wow. think is an un uh, an untapped market. It, it, it's a very different motivation there. Yep. But yeah, and, uh, enough of that. Dang. Yeah. I mean, what the freak? Yeah, that was good. <laughs> yeah, just talk. Just talk. Yeah, I'll so just sit here. <laughs> to bring it back to indigenous, you come up with a better word yet? No. Okay, local so bring it back to local <laughs> church yeah, planting. Right. Let, let me. Local indigenous. Let's bring it back by local saying, <laughs> just to kind of bring full circle in the transplant conversation there for a second. We want transplant church planters to come. Yeah, yeah. We just want them to come in a healthy way. Yeah. That's what we're trying yeah, to say. Yeah, yeah. But we also desperately recognize the the um, the beauty and the privilege and the and the opportunity for indigenous church planting because of they do love the people they're local they understand um, and so we were on the question of yeah. some obstacles but anything you want to add to that uh, to to obstacles um, oh uh, well I mean. I, I do think also to talk about transplant pastors a little bit more is just to say they are necessary. And the reason they're necessary is by the nature of New York City, there are a ton of transplants. Yep, it is right. a transient city in that there are people who make the city run and then there are people who come to make their money and leave. So like if we're going to be honest to the context, we do need people who can connect with mm -hmm. transplants. Mm -hmm. If I'm honest, that is not my heart. Right. Like my heart is for people who make the city run. Transplants are obviously more than welcome to come enjoy our community, be a part of our community. Like that's not, you know, I'm not I'm not placing a bar necessarily. Yeah. But what I am saying, though, is that the, the ministry that I'm burdened with is for people who are here and who are here to stay. Therefore, there is a huge need for transplant um, uh, uh, pastors and leaders to serve. Uh, uh, and connect with transplants. So that is to say a negative of being indigenous is I tend not to connect with transplants as much as I tend to with people who are from here. Uh, it's not to say I don't at all, but I yeah. tend not to, not as much. Lester, what about you? Some difficulties, negatives, obstacles to <clears throat> planting in the community you grew up in? I I would say, um, I feel like there's so many, but 
if I were to bring this back to you, Davi, like if I were to ask you, like, what do you think your biggest um, loss would be if your church plant was were to fail? What would it be? My biggest loss, yeah. I think, would be it would be personal. Yeah. Because part of the birth of this church, um, most of the people that that are there are are native New Yorkers. Most of the people that are there have are either still in or grew up in um, communities of color, communities that had uh, that were or, or lacked socioeconomic resources, right? So we were most of us were poor, um, and part of what this church means for us is that God has come to us too, hmm. right? God has come to people who did not have much, who are not super learned, who are not super uh, on the cutting edge, uh, people who. Um, are in deep need of a supernatural savior, right? Like we can't do social Jesus only because we need supernatural power, right? Like that's what we need. Yeah. So if Joyway were to fail, um, what it means to me is that, and obviously God sovereign and he'll yes. move things as yeah. he will, but what it would mean for me is that those people will feel like, man, I guess I guess God wasn't using me. I guess that I, I, I can't participate in what he's doing here. I guess I don't have enough. And I guess that not having enough means that I I can't be faithful in the same ways that I believe that God has called me to be faithful. Yeah. You know, there's something there that I really, because I'm always looking at, okay, if I were to fail, which I failed plenty of times, what are my, what is my cost? And the cost for someone who is local and indigenous church planters like us, it's that, well, we can't leave. Yeah, nowhere to go. Right. So that personal feeling that you're going is, and I felt this, which is, um, and I'm not saying that, you know, people who come here to church plant doesn't feel this, but I do feel like there is a another way out for those who There's no plan B here. for us. Right. Yeah. They, just, they can go if they yeah. choose to. Whereas for us, this is our life. This is our reputation. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, one of my examples is that when I was in my early 20s, I did a youth retreat and a youth girl had passed away. She drowned and she's from Elmhurst. Uh, I remember going to Wendy's that week afterwards and I just remember hearing somebody go, oh, that's the, that's Lester, the one who killed, you know, and then uh, the, the name of the, the youth girl. What? And I just remember going, I need to hide, but I can't go anywhere. I have no money. I can't go anywhere. You know, like no, there's no wow. like there's nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. So it's almost mm -hmm. like I already have the shame, and I was raised in a shame culture because we're immigrants. Right. Wow. And it's like you don't have a lot to run away to with anyway. Mm -hmm. So now I am I am just enveloped. Yeah. Not only with my shame, but with the judgment of wow. other people. Mm -hmm. You know. So it's like I can't move. But I'm stuck here yeah. with that shame with that, of yeah. not just myself, but the neighborhood. Yeah. Um, you know, so there's a huge cost for that. So I would say that's definitely, and I asked you that because I'm like, I, I yeah. bet you that's something that. A hundred percent. There's no hiding anymore. There's no running. There's no, like, there, there's no plan B, there's no other option. Yeah. If one day I just left Joyway, I'm still, oh, weren't You're you, there. weren't you a pastor of Joyway at the supermarket? Like, right. there's no, yeah. no, that's so true. Yeah. You so can't true. go anywhere, you know? Mm -hmm. So I feel like, our cost and our, our liability is so much higher mm -hmm. um, than someone it's who family, just come and go. It's family, right. it's friends, right. it's neighbors, it's enemies. It's yeah. Everyone is there at the same right. time. That's great. That's but I got to say, because of that, I do believe it's because because of that uh, fear that we might have, um, we also would push harder. Because now I'm like really trying to figure out what do I do with finances? Mm -hmm. um, you know, like I don't have a second, uh, I don't have a second, you know, pool to draw from. I only have this. This is the only thing I have. So I must focus on these few blocks. Mm -hmm. I must focus on these people. I must make it work. You know, like, and you will try, you will pray to your freaking like bleed yeah. tears. Like it mm -hmm. just, it is crazy, you know? So, um, whereas I feel like if you do know that you have a second, uh, like another option to leave, that's kind of, um, that kind of urgency is probably different. Yeah. I'm not saying that, and, and please, John, I, and, I love what you do. I love what Larry does. Mm -hmm. Like they, they, you guys really are different to me, um, you know. But there are others who come in, and I know they can leave at any time. Yeah. So therefore, I am now your project, and you can always leave at will. Yeah. Whereas when we do it, we don't have anywhere to go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So therefore, what we put in is high urgency, 
and we know this is where we're going to die. Yeah, hundred yeah. <laughs> percent. Yeah, yeah. You know, so so my thing is, I do feel like someone like you, David, is you and Io. Mm-hmm. What you've done is like you really had to put in every single second, everything that you've. Your marriages is on the line. Like everything is there. Your yeah. family sees. Your dad's a part of your church. Yeah. You know, like <laughs> that's different. You know, than someone who's a transplant. Their family is not all there. Like it's not like their 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 grandparents are mm-hmm. there. Like like we grew up in churches where our grandparents were there. You know, like our siblings are there, mm. our uncles are there. Man, there's so much shame. Yeah, <laughs> and everyone's watching. Yeah, yeah. and every, yeah, no, hundred percent. So this that's may this point. may yeah. give a uh, um modern day glimpse into what Jesus was talking about when he went back and ministered to his hometown and they responded, Hey, who's, who does Jesus think he is? Like we know his sisters, like we know his brothers, yeah. you know, and you know, he, he was unable to minister in the same way in his hometown. And so I'm guessing because I'm not an, uh, a local indigenous church planner, but I'm guessing that there are some difficulties around some of just the fact that people knew you before you were a pastor 100%. and what that looks like. Yeah. So talk about that for a second. Yeah. I mean, so for, <laughs> for me, <laughs> um, I, uh, I have made a ton of mistakes, both as like uh, a teenager and just like in the neighborhood um, as a young adult even. And I just have to sit in that. Yeah, just got to sit in it. Yeah. And there are people in my church who know, right? <laughs> like they remember they were there. Yeah. Like, so like, I, I can't, you know, um, and, and the, the negative is though, cause, uh, I'll also qualify it. The negative is that I can't escape it, but there's also strength there as well. Hmm. And there's strength there because now I actually have to rely on God's grace. Yeah. I can't hide. Oh, yeah. I can't. Even if I wanted to, I wow. cannot hide. I can't hide what my family looks like. I can't hide what my extended family looks like. In fact, a lot of my church was like invited to my wedding. So they met where I came from, like my extended family, uh, deep friends from co- like all these people they met and saw. Wow. And that has a reflection on me. And I can't hide from that. So like God's grace has to be real to me or it's not. It's one or the other, Yeah, wow. um, which is both difficult and painful, but also um, it's, it's empowering in that every step that I take where someone sees me and does not just view me for my sin, for my, just my brokenness, my mistakes, uh, things that I can't control. Like I think of a family member that wilds out and that has a reflection on you, all of those things, every second that they look at me and say, that's my pastor. That is pure grace. Wow. Pure grace. Debbie, can I just also add to that? I feel like, and I'm going to be honest, like, you know, even people that we dated when yeah. we were younger, they could end up in your church and it's awkward. Oh, one of because, mine has. So that's, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, and like, <laughs> and I'm just saying like, we weren't always a great Christian. Like, like even now it's, it's hard, you know, like we're yeah. not, we're not perfect. No. Um, but here's my, here's my gripe. Here's my, oh, I'm just getting mad. <laughs> Get mad, Lester. Yeah, Go for this, it. Is, this is my thing. And I've seen this happen over and over again where a transplant church planter might come and then they plant, but then we hear like, oh, maybe there's some issues about them, but then we ignore that. Yeah. But if you planted a church and I, and then your ex-girlfriend was there and they immediately say something about you because, you know, like you did something wrong, blah, blah, blah. You're already discredited. 100%. But it's because you're local and mm-hmm. then people can judge you so much quicker. But when that guy comes from God knows where, right? Like, and you know a little mm-hmm. bit about their history, but it's not held against them. And then now they're able to have control and they're able to, to pastor, you know, like large, like, you know, congregations of people in our, in our neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And I'm kind of like, you know, I can smell the toxicity in you, 100%. but nobody is saying anything because you came from a different place. But the guy that I really trust who could be a local person is not giving that same grace, mm-hmm. you know? So we automatically debunk and cancel you, but we allow this guy to come in and then now I'm like, yeah. I can't do anything because I he, he has no history. Here. Right. But I know. <laughs> yeah. We all hear things. And then we and then, you know, and then that's what's really frustrating because even large institutions would allow that. Hmm. I've honestly um, so uh, we'll, we're probably going to get into it a little bit more later. But uh, get one into of, it now. One, <laughs> of the, one of the big, I think, crises in um, local and or indigenous uh, church planting is that leadership development has struggled a ton here for a few reasons. One of the reasons that I see 
is that there are those who have the ability, especially in my context, to make it. So either go to college, get a high paying job, and they are able to do that because of some of the opportunities they're afforded, because they're very, uh, like really intellectually sharp, have a ton of willpower, whatever. And they decide not to become church leaders. And the reason is because church leaders, their history is all out there. They don't get paid very well. They don't have a phenomenal um, uh, reputation all the time. Like you're not, you don't have all this prestige. So why do that here? Either I'll do something else here or I'm going to go somewhere else and That's make right. more money. Or if they do love the church, they'll go somewhere else where they're getting paid a livable wage right, to be yeah. in uh, like Kansas or whatever. Uh, and they'll pastor a church out there. And I think that the 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 pandemic or the epidemic of that uh, does happen because of a lot of shame. Yeah. If you grew up in church. There is always dirt. I don't care who you are. Yeah. yeah. There has 100%. to be. If you dated a person. If you had a friend, if you did anything, there is dirt. And um, it is a lot easier, to your point, to say, oh, look at this guy who comes in and looks very perfect versus, ah, I know Lester. I've seen yeah. him before. Eh. Canceled. Yeah, 100%. Yep. 100%. But that, to your point, is only a product of locality, not of integrity or of yeah. spiritual maturity or any of that. Right. Yeah. Um, and that's led to a lot of leaders who have left. Yeah. Because of that. And that's so crazy because I would rather, and again, you, I'm not saying David's anything wrong. I'm just saying the example is having someone around and I know that he's local. If David, you did something wrong, I can at least go, well, I see that he's changing. Mm-hmm. I heard that he went to counseling, you know, like he's, he's going through it. Like I want you, I would rather have you. Like if I think about all of my companies, church planting is not my main thing, right? Like if I think about who I'm going to hire, I'd rather hire you mm-hmm. because I know you went through this this journey, I can pull up that history quick because you're local. Yeah. Compared to this person who just came in, I'm like, man, like you're actually pretty dangerous because I know nothing about you. But right. yet, in our in our churches, we would rather elevate this, you know, like the person outside, than look at someone who's local and say, hey, let's let's work with this. Yeah. You know, like this person's from the uh, from the neighborhood. They're going through stuff like everybody else. Mm-hmm. But at least I can go. Here's how much they have changed. Yeah. The counseling, the accountability what's going on. I can at least do that. But we somehow canceled this so much quicker. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then we welcome somebody in. That's could be very toxic. No, no, no. That's good. So moving to more the idea of the church planning aspect of it. Um, in my experience of working both with transplant and local indigenous pastors is you mentioned it earlier is that one of the difficulties of a local is they don't have the same fundraising network mm-hmm. that a lot of times outside yeah. Uh, pastors have. And so any advice, and maybe, maybe you're like, I have no answers to how this happens. <laughs> yeah. uh, but if, 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 an, if a local pastor is wanting to plant a church and they're going like, I, I, I have that issue. Yeah. W- w- what do I do? Yeah. What are, what are some things you might say to that um, person? <laughs> text me, bro. No, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, no. Uh, well, so, um, <clears throat> Queens Connexus is one of the one of the main resources that I came to. Um, there's uh, the church planting grant was yep. it was huge for us, um, both on the church planting end, uh, but also on the personal end. Like you know, trying to work at this full time, um, I needed to you know feed my family, so uh, yeah. <laughs> that was an yeah. important thing. Um, so I think that some of those networks are being developed more now. One of the things actually that uh, I, I don't connect with is that I started this church planting journey uh, a few years ago. I've never felt alone. So that's one mm. incredible gift that I know yeah. most of my church planting friends who've been doing it for a lot longer did not feel. I've never felt alone because pretty soon after we started Joyway, started coming to Queens Connexus and I had friends and a network and resources and all this stuff. So like, Join Queens Connexus if resources is something that is uh, that is something that you need. Um, but also, I don't know a single church planter who is either indigenous or even some who are transplants who don't also work. Yes, I just I don't know any who don't do that because cost of living is high. Church probably won't pay you in uh, for for a while. So like normalize the fact that you may have to be bivocational and that's okay and you haven't failed and you're not uh, being less than what you can be or any of that stuff. Um, and then also be a part of these networks because I think as these networks grow, uh, more opportunities for fundraising will will grow. But from what I see, that's kind of it. Um, 
church planting in the city is hard and that just should be normalized. Yeah. It's just hard. <clears throat> this is not an easy thing. And if it was easy, um, then we're probably doing something wrong. But like, it's, it's not easy actually for a few good reasons, if I'm honest, right? Like less people want to throw money at us because like you don't want to waste it anymore. And yeah. there've been a bunch yeah. of people who've come and they failed yep. because they didn't connect with the neighborhood and people are more skeptical. And it's probably a good thing. Yeah. yeah. It takes grit because the people here are gritty. Like you just have to be. And that's a good thing. Um, I think those are all my thoughts so far on, yes, on fundraising. Yeah. Um, uh, one of the things that, that I found is, uh, so no, no shade at, at InterVarsity, but they have like a, a, a fundraising model, um, that I think is, might work for me more than I'm an adult, but I know, uh, thinking about what ministry would look like long term just wouldn't have worked where you like ask friends to support you. Like <clears throat> all my friends are broke. So th- I can tell you this <laughs> is that that model probably won't work if you're planting primarily in lower income neighborhoods. Um, but I think, yeah, community, find a job. Um, and, uh, yeah, great, great church. And hopefully they'll pay you eventually. It's so funny because as you're speaking to me, I'm, I'm going, if I were to create a company for you, it would be partner with church planters. Meaning mm. if there was a, if there are, um, like transplants that are coming in, I would suggest not to, not to transplant on your own. Yeah. Meaning like, why don't you come and partner with someone who is from the local neighborhood? Yeah. And this way you bring your, listen, your money is important, right? Like money is important. I'm not going to lie. It's hard. Yeah. When I, when I see how we church plant, it is really tough for me to see my staff and say in the very beginning when we first church plant, it was going, how do I get you to a normal living wage? Because you have your masters, you work for over 10 years, 15 years, you should be at six digits. Yeah. You know, so my heart's always been, how do I advocate for these pastors yeah. and bring them to a normal wage so that they're less stressed, you know, like, and then their, their spouse or their children is not hating the church. Yeah. And then now they don't want to be Christians. And then we have less pastors mm-hmm. and then our seminaries die because no one wants to go to seminary. Like it's a whole trickle effect, you know? So now I'm thinking, okay, I look at you and I go, you're a great person and you have, you and I are great church planters. Money is a problem, mm-hmm. but I don't, I almost want to say, I don't want you to worry about money. Mm. I, because for you to worry about money, half of your time is going to be separated yeah. into something else. And you can't really focus on your people on raising a church plant. Why not have these transplant people come in and go, hey, like there's someone who here who can show you the ropes, partner with them and bring the money in, bring his salary up to norm. You can also get paid. But now you're working with someone who's from the neighborhood. You can also learn things. You can use th- things that he knows to grow this new church. To be more effective. It's almost like, yeah, and I, I see this in companies all the time, but we're not doing that for churches. I don't know why. I, you know I mean, I, I mean, yes, uh, if you're, we should do that with Queens Connections. Like, and if you're listening to this and you will help, we'll help you find a partnership. But yeah. I think one of the reasons is, is again, I, this turned into being mean to transplanters. Don't mean to be, but I think, I think it's a lot of times the unhealthy mindset that I have all the answers and Mm -hmm. I'm bringing, I'm bringing the gospel Mm -hmm. to New York when the gospel and God's already working here, you're coming to partner. And so it's the mindset. If you're willing to come and partner as you should, then come and partner, but most aren't having that mindset. That's true. Yeah. And, and, and it's, and I don't think it's, I think it's wrong. I don't think it's intentionally of course not yeah evil on one's part it's ignorance yeah. Yeah. it's just not knowing right. it, it's not realizing right. it, the growing curve so and so so as an encouragement to because we want to prop up indigenous church planting we want to say yes to this we want to encourage this uh we we do offer as you mentioned ways to partner mm-hmm. our church planter training and different things we want to partner because we want to see locals serving their community because there's a huge uh, they're, they're negatives, mm-hmm. but there are way more positives, yeah. way more positives. And yeah. so we want to, we want to try to encourage yeah. that and foster that. Yeah. Jonathan, I think, I think what you're saying about, um, yes, there's nothing wrong with that. We're not, you know, putting down your body. Um, I just, I just want to make it clear though, that there's, and I'm talking to transplants, there's nothing you're thinking that we haven't already thought of. <laughs> and there's nothing you're thinking that we haven't thought of that could be 10 times better That's right. if we had the money. Because again, what we just said earlier is that we have a lot more at stake than you do. Mm-hmm. So when we think about if we had a million dollars, we're gonna use every penny to its fullest. Oh yeah. 
because we know yeah. <laughs> this is I've our sat last and stop. thought about this every yeah. day, all the time. What are some ways? What are some ways? Right. Yep. Some, yeah. So if I'm looking at you as like an investment, mm -hmm. I'm going. This is who I would. This is who I would invest into, because this person is going through the you know the yeah. the hardships of things. And I yeah. and I want to interject here and I want to say something just in case someone happens to listen to this next thirty seconds that has some money and they're outside of New York City. I want to challenge you, speak to the camera, <laughs> I want to challenge you to ask the question, could I partner with a local indigenous church planter with these funds instead of a transplant? And at least ask the question. And you may have a transplant church planter that you've trained, and so you want to partner with them, great. But if you're looking to partner in New York City, there is tons of opportunity. If you happen to get a hold of this and you're listening to this, queensconnexus.org, reach out to us. We can partner with faithful people like David and dozens others here in Queens that just need someone to come alongside them and say, hey, I'm here to help you do what God's called you to do. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, I have great confidence Absolutely. in that. No, I think I think to your point, like that 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 investment would be so important. I'm thinking there are a few guys at, at our church um, so they grew up in the neighborhood, right? Like real hood dudes. Uh, so like love them. Um, they were, uh, all of them have leadership capability, ability to understand the Bible, ability to communicate the Bible, ability to lead. Um, they love Jesus, love, love, love their neighborhood. But because they lack financial investment and resources, um, they are now struggling to grow as efficiently and as quickly as they possibly could. Um, some of that happens, right? Just from like national socioeconomics, mm -hmm. all of them grew up poor. Most of them didn't go to college. Most of them didn't have the opportunity to do that because they either had to work um, or a bunch of other bunch of other things um, in the way there. But there are even more leaders who we don't have the opportunity to give to yet because they need to be developed because we need a preemptive investment. So like those guys, you would never find. Yeah. But there never. are a ton of them. Absolutely. Yeah. There yeah. are a ton of them who are simply being overlooked because they haven't had opportunity. Right. And that there is an investment that can be given to give them That's opportunity. So yeah. So that we actually don't need as many transplants. So yeah. crazy. I mean, yeah. do, do we even even I love when you and Io do, right? Like <laughs> what you're doing is, is amazing. And you're right. Money is an issue mm -hmm. because the neighborhood you're reaching out to, the people that you're working with. They're not rich people. No. Like we don't have a lot of that in our neighborhoods, right? So even think about sending a lot of your members to seminary is impossible. Yeah, well, you know, and, so, and that being a bar for ministry. Right, yeah. because immigrants are going, you need to be accredited. Mm -hmm. So then they'll always look for the person who has accreditation, who is probably from another place, and then mm -hmm. they'll value them better. Mm -hmm. But we don't have the resources to go, in, to go into seminary. So. So what I just I'm hearing is when you start a seminary, yeah, that's well, affordable here in Queens. Well, I just want to say also, All right. like, RTS, like the Jay Harvey <laughs> yeah. Reform Theological Seminary, they always look out for how do we get scholarships. Yeah, yeah. and I and love we that offer they scholarships. Do that. That's mm -hmm. right. Well. We offer scholarships. That seminary offers scholarship. Like they look out for us because they know this is what we're struggling with. Yeah, you know, I would say, I would say, because seminary. I mean, because I've had these conversations also with with Dr. Harvey. I mean, even we think about Io himself, yep. right? So I mean, he would tell you very simply. Um, his ability, the opportunity for him to go to college was not there. And the reason was not that he wasn't smart enough to get in. He got in, actually went to a few college courses. It's his ability to sustain a college experience was unrealistic for him because yeah. at some point he had to pay rent. He had to uh, support people in, in his family, namely his sister. Like He had to support people. So if... Seminary is the main way that we understand leaders are developed and made and shaped and get their biblical understanding. Then someone like Io could never and should never preach, should never pastor, should never lead. But that track simply doesn't make sense. And that then leads to less indigenous pastors yeah, being able right. to lead. Yeah. Right? Like So because we're tied with the, the American education system and its same bars and its same uh, limitations, that then leads to less people right. who are from our neighborhoods uh, having the opportunity to do what God has called them to do. And what I would also argue is just not a biblical standard. Now, seminary is a phenomenal... I love 
love seminary. I go to yeah. seminary. Yeah. You're not met in seminary. Right? Yeah, I just realized that. that. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 we're sitting here talking about like, hey, did hey, we, we meet our test? Yes, we met our test. Yeah, it was Keller's Christian Life and Secular yes. Culture. That's when I realized I had no idea what I was doing here in New York. Wow, really? <laughs> I was like, Dude, uh, that was a that class. class humbled me. Oh man. Um, yeah, so so like you know, I, I I'm a proponent of that, and seminary is, has the opportunity to equip people like yeah. me. Who I mean, I had two parents. My uh, uh, my mother's a social worker, father was a chef. Uh, I, w- I had the opportunity to go to college. Once I did, came back, got, uh, got a job, worked in, uh, and then went to grad school. So like I had all of those resources, but for them who don't fit that. We also need to find, if we're going to talk about indigenous yeah. uh, um, uh, church planting, ways for them to engage here. Because yeah. the moment they don't exist, other than like me trying to teach them as much as I can, wow. and hopefully they get up to that standard, and then also working through the insecurities that exist there, because like I have this ability, and that must mean that this is what the bar looks like. Mm. And if they can't, then okay, maybe I must not be called. And it's this whole thing that we've got to we've got to fix. Wow. Yeah. I mean, even even just thinking about that, like if if I'm talking to a transplant, it's true partnership, mm-hmm. like meaning you come and you partner with us. Don't just say like, oh, I'm here for partnering with God, but partner with the people, right? Like, the people <laughs> of God, yeah, you know, like <laughs> the people, because we're here. Yeah, yeah. You know, what? again, like I guarantee you, you have not thought of something that we haven't thought of already. Mm-hmm. And if we had the financial resources, we would have done it ten times better than you. Yeah, you know, so. That's and that's just, not an arrogant statement. Yeah. That's just truthful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I'm, I am being a little bit arrogant. Um, thank <laughs> you, Jonathan. It's very kind of you. But um, no, I, and I, I want to back us up because I feel like people, we are savvy. We are street smart. You know, so it's hard to get that here. Mm-hmm. You bring in a bunch of people who are very intelligent, but you're not street smart. And when we smell that from you, man, like I'm running. Either I'm running or I want to like... Like get rid of you mm-hmm. <laughs> because you're gonna hurt my people. That's yeah. what we're thinking. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, so it's hard to find savvy, street smart, intelligent Christian people. Yeah. And I'm going, I see one. Right. And I'm like, invest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like seriously, yeah. as we're speaking, I'm like, we should have a tab on Queens Connexus and go like partner with these yeah. church plants. I've got a lot of ideas. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like that's just so, so crazy. Oh, yeah. yeah. Anyway, yeah. sorry. No, no, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You and Io are great. Just <laughs> you're great. Oh, you're, great. You. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you're great. You're <laughs> great. You're great too. <laughs> All right. Sorry. So, uh, indigenous church planting. Yeah. We've talked about what it is. We've talked about the positives, the negatives, the need for it, the want for it. Uh, any other advice? Any other thing that you just feel like, hey, this needs to get talked about? since we're on this topic. Um. Yeah. Um, one of the, the things that I, I still wrestle with in regard to, to raising up indigenous leaders is um, there are barriers that are kind of, they, they feel like intangibles. I, I still haven't fully placed my finger on what it is that makes leadership development fully difficult other than the socioeconomic and, um, lack of um, lack of training, all that stuff. Um, but there is a sense in the Christian world that if you're from a specific place, you are not the leader. You mm-hmm. are not the church planter. You are the story that gets fundraising. You are the uh, the the great help. Oh. You are the story of salvation. But you can never mm-hmm. be the leader or the pastor. And I think that there are a lot of either transplants who come and start successful churches or even some indigenous pastors um, who come and just want people who are ready to go and therefore will get transplants from um, outside of the city to be like their number two or to be like uh, um, high capacity leaders or whatever. Um, There are a ton of leaders here that require investment and that investment is going to take a lot of time and a lot of resource, a lot of headache and a lot of reminding them that they're worthy and that God has Mm. called them and that they, and that they matter. Um, But that comes from a world that has told them that they don't and the work is worth Mm. it. Um, We have again, three uh, ministers in training who fit this description exactly. Can't tell you the amount of times that they were capable but we had to say, hey, bro, I promise God has called you and don't walk away from this. I promise you, I promise you, I promise you God is doing something in you. And they needed to be told that for most leaders that I know, they would have been let go because they're saying, oh, I guess they don't have the confidence. I guess they don't have the the leadership ability. I guess that they're not the most eloquent speaker in the world. So I guess they're not called. Mm-hmm. And it's not true. So many people here 
so much to invest in. Please do it. And it will take time. Um, but do it. It's worth it. Yeah. Yeah. Less there anything else you would add just to the conversation? I want to, but I think I'm just going to get angry. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I love what you just said. You know, yeah. a part of me then went right to the other side. And I'm going, why are we not val- like valuing people like what you're describing? And I'm going, it's because well, when you have people like transplants come in, that's who I am idolizing now. And it's almost like that's who I'm being measured up against. Yeah. So of course I, I can't, I don't have a good family. You know, mm-hmm. like I don't have the finances. I, I don't look like you, mm-hmm. but you're always going to look better because you, you have the money. You do have the resources. Your churches do look much bigger than our whole house churches. And like, it just looks sexier. Mm-hmm. I do not look like that, you know? So therefore I just don't fit it. And then this way I, I feel like I'm almost putting myself down. Yeah. Um, and then, and then couple in there with maybe like, you know, like, uh, I don't know, family upbringing with our families and we're not always encouraged. Mm-hmm. And, you know, th- there's this whole thing there now. And then those voices are now in my head. And then, and then I see you and I'm like, wow, I can't be like you. Um, and it sucks. Yeah. Not saying though that you shouldn't be here. I'm just saying that that's what's, I feel like that's what's happening. Yeah. You know, so what can you do? I'm going, why not still come? I'm not saying don't come, right? Mm -hmm. Like we're not saying that. Mm. Um, But I got to say like, Jonathan, if I could just put you on the spot right now. Put me on the spot. Yeah. Like I love that you came and I go, that's a healthy leader, Mm -hmm. right? Like not that weird, but we don't have examples of that. So then I can go. I can do what I do, but also I can react differently because Jonathan didn't see that as a threat. He saw that as a way to love them. Mm-hmm. We would be like, yo, you you try to put me down, like, you know, we got to fight you, you know, like, because that's a natural thing. We're yeah, always yeah. in fight mode. Not mm-hmm. that you're not, but you come in a much healthier way. There's plenty of times when Jonathan would be like, oh, it's probably because they're having a bad day. And I'm like, yeah. they're not having a bad day. They try to put me down, you know, like, they, they just defame me. I'm humiliated, <laughs> you know, like, but that's yeah. I, through all the counseling stuff that we're going through. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Redeemer Counseling Services. Um, <laughs> I'm going, oh, that's my outdated childhood self, you know, but that's what we're dealing with. Yeah. You know, that's what you're describing. Those people like they have the opportunity, but they feel like they don't measure up. Yeah. But I look at Jonathan, and I go, you can show me a different way. Yeah. You know, yeah. like there's plenty of people like Jonathan, but like if I look at you specifically, I'm like, even the way you raise your family is different. Mm-hmm. And I bet you a lot of us can be like, oh, that's very healthy. Um, you know, like our families don't raise us that way. Like it's, we just get beat <laughs> and it's normal. It's normal. Yeah, like it's so yeah, crazy. Yeah. Cause even in another podcast, I was like, it's normal that my, my parents just like beat me until we were bleeding. And I'm not kidding. But then everyone's like, oh, that's weird. I'm like, that's not weird. That's normal. <laughs> like, you know, it's a norm for yeah. us. But, but I say, I'm just saying like, when you come in, it's, it is helpful because it then shows me that you're partnering with me. I can see a healthier and more secure way of doing things. Mm-hmm. Um, and also you can bring resources that we don't readily have here, you know? So I'm just going, but also we're not, I'm not selling ourselves. I'm not selling ourselves short. We have the street smarts and the savviness. We know our neighborhoods yeah. and that's what we offer in mm-hmm. return. Yeah. So I'm going, why not do that together? There's a knowledge of the neighborhood. And the thing that I was again, thinking about these guys, like there was also things about how the gospel impacts us here that we will understand that other people will not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, I was thinking a, a friend of mine was telling me that uh, he, he preached recently, uh, first time at Joyway, and he was saying that um, I haven't achieved a lot in my life. And it was empowering to know that God saved me from sin and he gave me a new family. And also he can empower me to be someone now. Like wow. I, 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 I can be a person who can contribute something to another. I used to have to take, I used to have to accept things from people, their scraps or whatever. And now I have something to share with someone. And I don't think that that's like a gospel insight that someone from outside would have. That the gospel yeah. can provide you with something to share and that that gives you dignity yeah. and meaning and, and that, 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 that makes you into a new human in that way. So like, you're right. Like we know the neighborhood and we can also apply the gospel to our neighborhood That's and good. to our people in ways that no one else can because it was given to us first. Yeah. Like I think that the, the incarnation is what, what's been coming up for me in this conversation a lot. Mm. And it's, it's how has Christ come to the neighborhood? 
how has he met us here? And I think that's something that indigenous leaders and pastors can speak to with more with more power and more gravitas because I grew up in this neighborhood. I can see how Christ shows up at the bodega. Yeah, yep. I can see how Christ shows up Amen. in my living room, Amen. not just on a screen, not just uh, through Calvin's readings. Like, like yeah. I can see how Christ shows up yeah. here. And that's where I think a lot of the power from a, a ministry standpoint comes from. You can see how Christ would show up to a brothel here in yep. Elm. Like no one else could tell you that. Nope. Nobody. Nope. So like that's the stuff that for me gives me a lot of uh, a lot of life and a lot of this is why I need to make this work because I can show them how Christ has shown up for me here and that's what they need. They don't just need a cookie cutter gospel. They need a Jesus who sees me and says that yes, you are sinful and you uh, uh, you you lack all things, but I'm here to give you all things because of who Christ is. Like that's the stuff. <laughs> She's going to hit record on this for, for on Sunday for my next sermon. Wow. <laughs> my bad. I didn't even preach. I'm sorry. That's so I'm good. Sorry. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, gentlemen, thank yeah. you. And I just want to wrap up yeah. and say this. To those who don't may not know Queens Connexus culture, I want you to hear me say that we are pro transplant church plants. Yes. We're pro indigenous church plants. But we love this city too much to just sugarcoat these important topics. And so you may be listening to this going like, these guys just gripe about certain things. But no, we want to be honest because we want to do better for the sake of the church, the people of the kingdom of God and God's glory. Mm -hmm. And so this is who we are. And so we've done a podcast on transplant church planning. If you haven't listened to that, I encourage you to listen to that. And so we talk about the positive and negatives of, of all of these things. And we're always going to be honest because we want to push one another we want to be better. We love this city, and we want locals. We want people outside to come. We we want to we want to learn from mistakes as well, and we want to come in a healthy way. So if you hear this and you're like, "Man, these guys are angry," we're not. No, we're actually uh. very loving. <laughs> I, I think uh, I might but, be, <laughs> but we care. We care. Yeah. It, 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 and I'll close with this illustration of Keller gives this illustration that love and anger go side and side. And he said, "Think about it." He said, it's because you love your friends or because you love your family that when they're doing things that are harmful to them, you get angry with them. Mm -hmm. And he said, if you didn't love them, you wouldn't care. You'd be apathetic. Mm -hmm. And so if you see emotions from us ever that you might think, well, those are, ang no, we're not angry. We're loving. Mm -hmm. We love so much mm -hmm. that we have emotions. <laughs> Don't speak for me. I am angry. <laughs> <laughs> in the world? I, I love you. But yes, you're angry but because angry. You, you're yeah. angry because you love what we're yeah. talking about. You so, love see, this city. is what I mean. I'm yeah. like, what are you talking, where did that come from? So polite and so nice. Yeah. I need to learn from you. Yes. Uh, we are very, we love you. And <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, yeah. so if you're angry. local, come be a part of Queens Connexus. We want to offer not only resources, but we want to offer mm -hmm. friendship, mm -hmm. relationship, and partnership as we collaborate together for the sake of the gospel yeah. advancing here in the city that we love so very much. Thanks, guys. Thank you.